Good morning. Open your Bibles this morning to 1 Corinthians chapter 9. We're working our way through uh, Paul's letter, his first letter that we have to the church at Corinth. And we're looking at what it means to be a mature church, being mature Christians. We just finished up uh, previously chapter 8 where he talked about food sacrifice to idols and that our, our liberty should never be used as an opportunity of the enemy to harm other people, that we should freely give up our rights, if you will, for the sake of others and uh, not always exercise our our freedoms uh, when they can be harmful spiritually to to others who are seeking Christ. We're going to be in chapter 9, though, this this morning. The title of this message is Giving All to Win. And uh, uh, this is uh, just as a pastor, this is a little bit difficult, and it's kind of bold words uh, from Paul, uh, but uh, words that I will be faithful to preach nonetheless, whether it's awkward for me or not. And so if you would, just go ahead and stand with me. 1 Corinthians chapter 9, and we will begin at the first verse. I'm going to read the whole chapter uh, but we won't get through all of it thoroughly. Uh, uh, I'll, I'll catch the last part tonight at Mackey Campus at 6 p.m. this evening at Mackey Campus is when we'll finish up chapter 9. But I want to read it all today, so uh, bear with me. Uh, this is the reading of the Word of God. The Bible says this, Am I not free? Am I not an apostle? Have I not seen Jesus our Lord? Are not you my workmanship in the Lord? If to others I am not an apostle, at least I am to you. For you are the seal of my apostleship in the Lord. This is my defense to those who would examine me. Do we not have the right to eat and drink? Do we not have the right to take along a believing wife, as do the other apostles and the brothers of the Lord and Cephas? Or is it only Barnabas and I who have no right to refrain from working for a living? Who serves as a soldier at his own expense? Who plants a vineyard without eating any of its fruit? Or who tends a flock without getting some of the milk? Do I say these things on human authority? Does not the law say the same? For it is written in the law of Moses, You shall not muzzle an ox when it treads out the grain. It is for oxen that God, is it for oxen that God is concerned? Does he not certainly speak for our sake? It was written for our sake, because the plowman should plow in hope, and the thresher thresh in hope of sharing in the crop. If we have sown spiritual things among you, is it too much if we reap material things from you? If others share this rightful claim on you, do not we even more? Nevertheless, we have not made use of this right. But we endure anything rather than put an obstacle in the way of the gospel of Christ. Do you not know that those who are employed in the temple service get their food from the temple? And those who serve at the altar share in the sacrificial offerings. In the same way, the Lord commanded that those who proclaim the gospel should get their living by the gospel. But I've made no use of any of these rights, nor am I writing these things to secure any such provision. For I would rather die than have anyone deprive me of my ground for boasting. For if I preach the gospel, that gives me no ground for boasting. For necessity is laid upon me. Woe to me if I do not preach the gospel. For if I do this of my own will, I have a reward. But if not of my own will, I am still entrusted with a stewardship, what then is my reward? That in my preaching I may present the gospel free of charge, so as not to make full use of my right in the gospel. For though I am free from all, I have made myself a servant to all, that I might win more of them. To the Jews I became as a Jew in order to win Jews. To those under the law I became as one under the law, though not being myself under the law, that I might win those under the law. To those outside the law I became as one outside the law, not being outside the law of God, but under the law of Christ, that I might win those outside the law. To the weak I became weak, that I might win the weak. 
I have become all things to all people that by all means I might save some. I do it all for the sake of the gospel that I may share with them in its blessings. Do you not know that in a race all the runners run, but only one receives the prize? So run that you may obtain it. Every athlete exercises self-control in all things. They do it to receive a perishable wreath, but we an imperishable. So I do not run aimlessly. I do not box as one beating the air, but I discipline my body and keep it under control, lest after preaching to others, I myself should be disqualified. Let's pray. Father. We give you thanks and we honor you today, dear Lord, in our worship and by our response to the preaching of your word. And when your word is proclaimed, Father, uh, we want to honor you and worship you by appropriately responding with yes to your will and to your way. Speak to us today, Lord, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. You can be seated. Well, there's a lot here, obviously, in chapter 9, and Paul is uh, moving through. He's dealt with this issue already of, of the idols and that the, the, this could be a hindrance to the gospel. And uh, you'll note all through here, everything Paul is dealing with is about not just a hindrance to the proclamation of the gospel, but it's, it's really tied to our own maturity. In other words, don't let you get in the way of what God wants to do in other people's lives. And so now Paul moves and he starts to talk about his rights and his ability. In fact, he makes a pretty lengthy argument uh, for the sake of, of supporting the pastor, supporting the preacher, the prophet, the priest, whatever you want to call them, in your midst. And, uh, and, and among that, he, he gives a, a number of expenses. I'm going to kind of move at it backwards a little bit because he takes, the second argument is uh, that he makes allusion to the Old Testament priesthood. And in the Old Testament, the priests were, were uh, supported by the rest of the people, by the sacrifices, by the offerings, by the gifts uh, at the temple. Uh, the priests, the, the Levitical tribe, which were the priests, were supported uh, uh, physically, uh, financially, in, in every way. They were supported so that they would be free to operate as priests among the people, pastor the people, uh, focus in on the spiritual components of the life of the people. And by the way, that's why we uh, have pastors today uh, and, we, and, and we support them. Now, not all pastors this, are this way. It's not an essential thing necessarily, but it's a, it's a good thing and it's an important thing to be able to have someone who's, who does not have to be focused on another job, doing other things, but their holistic focus is for the spiritual betterment of the people of God, that the ministry of the kingdom of God would move forward, that they are equipping and enabling and assisting and helping and being a blessing to everybody that's part of the body of Christ. And we'll talk more about this, this idea of the body and, and, uh, and things at another time, but uh, this is what the tithe was for. This is what the tithe was for. Not only the support of the, the temple as a structure and operating that in that way, but also to take care of the priests. Paul makes uh, uh, another uh, kind of uh, offer to them uh, about why uh, pastors, missionaries, prophets, evangelists, those, those kinds of, all those roles, ministerial roles, should be supported. He says, who serves as a soldier at their own expense? So his, his, uh, his, his uh, point simply being that uh, every, everything that people are called to do is, uh, that is, is a livelihood is expected in some way. And so while that doesn't preclude or exclude, I should say, uh, bivocational pastors or, or, uh, or folks who, who are, have a full-time job and then preach on, on the weekends and that kind of thing, it's not excluding them by any stretch of the imagination. But the goal of the body should always be to say, we want to be able to have a, a, a spiritual leader in our midst, a pastor, uh, someone uh, who will speak the truth and their focus 
focus is to listen to God, pray, seek the Lord, give vision for us as a people, and help us move the ministry forward by uh, preaching, praying, and pastoring, caring for the folks. Part of that is equipping and uh, the, the like. He, he goes on in verse 9, he says, "You shall." he talks about the Old Testament law, you shall not muzzle an ox when it treads out the grain. And then he asks the question, is, is God really concerned so much about the ox? Uh, now, uh, some people might say that that is God's primary concern. That's not, that's not really the point. The point uh, Paul is trying to make is don't restrict the natural benefit of labor. All right? So when this ox is treading out the grain, he said, don't muzzle it because what would happen? When these oxen are treading out the grain from time to time, they would, they would uh, dip their head down and get a mouthful of grain to eat. And he's saying, don't, don't do that for these oxen. They need to have the reward on some level of their labor. Certainly you'll benefit from their labor, but they also need that care and benefit from what they are doing. Oh, don't restrict uh, the blessing uh, to the prophet among you. I think this has to do why we just are around Easter and Thanksgiving, we have our missions offering that goes specifically to the World Evangelism Fund that funds ministry around the world, including missionaries and the infrastructure that's needed for all those kinds of things. And why do we, well, some people say, well, I think that if somebody really is called of God, they should do it for free. Well, I think they should be willing to do it for free. And no matter what you get paid, you should be willing to serve the Lord and do what God's called you to do first and foremost. In fact, that's that's kind of Paul's argument here is that, hey, whether I get paid or not, I'm going to preach the gospel because the real benefit of preaching the gospel is that I get to offer up the gospel to people who have never heard it before and people can respond to that. That's the great blessing about it. That's the great thing. Now, what happens is we get hung up sometimes because there are some, quote, spiritual leaders who have manipulated what the Word says, have manipulated sincere followers of Jesus Christ, and they have fleeced the flock. They have absolutely taken advantage. And it's a shameful thing. It's a wicked thing. And they will stand one day in judgment before the living God and answer for what they have done. But make no doubt about it, there is a responsibility of the church to care for the people of God that are called to full-time ministry. Missionaries, evangelists, pastors, all these should be blessed by us that receive from them in physical ways so that they can continue to do and fulfill fully the call of God. I think it's important how you treat the pastor. Now, I know that I'm a pastor, and maybe you can disregard that, and that will be up to you to disregard the word. But I do think that there's a very real reality that those who are disrespectful and, uh, and mean-spirited and gossip and malign or whatever they might do, uh, those who are called of God will answer to God for that. Uh, those who are anointed, the Bible speaks clearly, uh, touch not mine anointed be careful how you treat those who are called of God now what does that mean because I've heard some pastors talk about that and say well that means you can't disagree with the pastor no that's not what it means you can support the pastor without agreeing with everything the pastor or an evangelist or a missionary says or does all right I hope you would understand that. There is a way to go about that. In other words, let me give you an example. Let's say there's something goes on in the life of the church and the pastor does something that you don't like what he does. Then your responsibility is not to gossip about that with other people, but to go to the pastor first and foremost and deal with that. See if you can sort through working through that uh, in the right kind of way. Don't talk to other people. Don't try to start a rebellion. Uh, in the Old Testament, there's a story of, of a guy named Korah who organized a rebellion against God's called leader, which was Moses. And God dealt very severely with Korah uh, because he led that rebellion. I will tell you that I have seen it happen before that, bec that because there were some folks who just didn't like the pastor for whatever reason, I will tell you there is a residual curse for those who would oppose God's appointed person. 
and go about it in the wrong kind of way. You can disagree, but you can still respect someone. You can still honor someone, though you don't agree with everything that they, they believe or stand for. Now, I'm not talking about stepping outside of orthodoxy. I'm not talking about stepping outside of uh, um, the moral boundaries all right, that, that's totally different. Once you step outside of the truth of the gospel of Jesus Christ, then you've stepped out of orthodoxy. You've stepped out of the anointing, no doubt, and no, no doubt you have rejected the lordship of Christ. So that person is no longer under the, uh, the, the expectation for the, uh, the rest of us to honor them and respect them because they have taken the, uh, the great responsibility of speaking the gospel truth and they've thrown that out the door. And once that's happened, there's a whole different ball game, all right? Once they've stepped out and failed morally and compromised the integrity of their calling and the integrity of the pulpit and the integrity of the proclamation of the gospel of Jesus Christ, that is a serious offense. Scripture is clear that those who teach are going to be judged in a stricter way and those who preach and those who lead in the church will be judged in a stricter way no doubt about it the point simply is this that paul's making he had a right though he did not demand it of the the church there in corinth he had a right to say you know what i expect that you would support financially tend to the physical needs the life of the pastor now, before you get too concerned, I just want you to know that, that uh, our church does just that for, for myself and my family, that I'm well taken care of. I'm not asking for anything. I'm just preaching the word, all right? Not asking, looking for anything. I'm well taken care of. I am blessed. I recognize that. Uh, but what I'm saying is, is the word has to be preached. All right, number two. I think there's, there's, a, there's a, just a reality in here that's, that, that we have got to support the spiritual gifts, talents, and callings of other people. All right? We've got such an individualism uh, in the church today where I, well, it doesn't matter. I'm going to do my thing, and I don't care what anybody else does. And that's, that's not a Christ-like attitude. There's this idea that we are working within the body. And part of the pastor's job is not to do everything, is not to be the hired hand around here, and not to be, I, I, if you want to get me upset, it's hard to get me upset. If you want to get me upset, tell me, come up to me and say, I pay your salary because I put money in the offering. I, I want you to hear this. There's nobody that pays my salary Christ makes provision for me. I'm not a hired hand, but I do have a responsibility, and that responsibility is to serve the body of Christ, is to serve, that's to equip the saints, is to care for the sheep, is to be an under-shepherd, if you will. I'm not the head of the church, Christ is the head of the church, but I do have a responsibility to make sure Christ remains as head and that there are not uh, elements or people or myself or anyone else who would manipulate the polity of the church, who would manipulate the organization of the church to gain power or prestige or name above the name of Jesus. Because the church is only the church when Jesus is the head. When Jesus is the head. Support of a pastor is never about manipulation of the message. When people threaten to uh, take their tithe elsewhere or go somewhere else because they don't like what's being preached. Make sure that what you don't like about what's being preached, it better be that it's not of the word of God rather than some kind of nuance of, I didn't like the style, I didn't like this, or some kind of a thing like that. We've got to be careful about those kinds of things. The church can, can easily become institutionalized, and the problem with the institutions is they get tied down with bureaucracy and, uh, and red tape. And a lot of times churches have grown to such an extent that, that, there's, that they begin to quench out the freedom of the Holy Spirit because uh, they don't have leadership that is committed to equipping the saints but also managing and discerning the Spirit of Christ in a place. Let me give you an example of this quickly. Um, uh, there are some churches that get to a, to a level uh, in terms of attendance where they say, you know what, we better be careful about having testimonies or allowing people to just stand up and testify because... <clears throat> Because uh, uh, to give that kind of freedom, people could say anything. And you know what? You're right. 
they could say anything. Someone could get up and say something that's not true, something that's awkward, something that's false, or whatever. And so some churches say, well, let's just alleviate that altogether by quenching everybody's voice in the service except for those that we have predetermined have, authorized, have been authorized. Now, the problem with that, uh, in, in my, in my, from my perspective, and I think according to the Word, is that it hinders... It hinders and bottlenecks everything into just the preacher, the pastor, the prophet. They're the only one that can speak. They're the only one that are, are, are allowed to be moved by the Holy Spirit and, uh, and contribute to the spiritual dynamic of what's taking place in the life of a, a worship service, the spiritual life of a worship service. And so it's kind of like we get to this place, and, and I, I know there needs to be guidelines about things, and I know that there are some times where people need to be talked to because they get out of line, they ramble on for too long, or they get off on tangent issues instead of glorifying Christ or speaking in the Spirit. They're not necessarily always of the Spirit. And, but I want to be sensitive to the fact that it might just be that in a worship service, and hey, maybe you say this is hard for you to say, but I know it's not hard for me to say, but it might just be that God speaks not through the sermon and not through a worship song it may just be that he speaks through someone's obedience to testify to the greatness and the goodness of God and if we're not careful we get so big we get too big for our own britches and we've got all kinds of policy well before you testify you'll need to present before a committee then fill out a form then wait six months and get in the order of service and da 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 and we quench out the work of the Holy Spirit now what does that mean That means, yeah, there is some danger because somebody might jump up and say something we don't necessarily agree with. And you know what? That's the responsibility of the spiritual leadership of the church to deal with those kinds of issues. And so me as a pastor, if I am running the service, if I'm I'm leading the service, I have authority, I have leadership, and that might mean that I have to cut off somebody who's outside of the Spirit. And so when they get far enough off kelter outside of the will of God then I've got to deal with that sometimes I have to deal with that not publicly all the time to shame someone but you have to go to someone privately after the fact and say hey listen you need to temper down you said some things that weren't always right on 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 in line and so you need to be mindful of that all those kinds of things but it's important for us to continue to give freedom to and recognize that people are called We've gotten in our mindset, worship is, we, we view it more like a concert. Come and I'm entertained. I didn't like that song. I didn't like that song. Oh, I like that song. Now you're singing my favorite song. That's not what it's about. Well, the sermon is kind of like a, a speech or a stand-up comedy hour. You know, am I entertained? Do I, do I like it? Did I enjoy it? And all those kinds of things. Rather than a dynamic of I am coming in the Spirit and I am contributing in some way to the spiritual vitality of these very moments. And if you don't contribute in any way, then in some ways you might be hindering the Spirit of Christ in your life. Then finally, the last, the last point Paul makes is, is, again, that he surrendered his rights. Over and over, this has come up over and over again. He, he's saying, I'm not here to exercise my rights. I'm here and I've surrendered my rights. God's call in Paul's life was not dependent upon the benefits he had uh, a right to. No pay? Well, he's still going to preach. No food, he's still going to be witnessing. No wife, he still has a family, it's a family of God. In other words, no matter what someone might say about him, no matter whether people do the right thing to him or not, he's going to do what God's called him to do. He surrendered his rights to do anything else. He's responding to the call of God. Reverend Steve Stetler a few years ago spoke at a, at a holiness conference, and he was the principal uh, at the time of a, of a Christian school. He had dyslexia, and he struggled growing up in school. And I, I'll never forget, in fact, I wrote it down when he said it because it, it so profoundly impacted me. He said, God didn't deliver me from dyslexia. He delivered me from a mindset that I was incomplete as long as I had dyslexia. In other words, what he said was, I thought all along that the problem that I had in my life was that I had dyslexia, and it was the limiting factor. And no matter what God wanted for my life, I could never get beyond this. And so, God, if you want to use me, you're going to have to deal with this. If you want to use me effectively for the kingdom, you're going to have to remove my dyslexia. But hear this today. God is not limited by your shortcomings. He is not limited by your inability. He is not hindered by what you can 
cannot do. In fact, he is looking for someone, not who has all the ability, but someone who is willing to allow him to work through them so that he would receive the glory. Praise God. In the same way God is not limited by your shortcomings, neither is God strengthened by your talents. The kingdom is no better off because you have a talent that you've given to him. Or uh, you have a talent, but that you are surrendered to him. In verse 12, here's really the point. In verse 12, the last part, he says, We endure anything rather than put an obstacle in the way of the gospel of Christ. He's saying, you don't pay me, even though I know I've got a right for it. He's made a biblical Old Testament argument and a, and, and a practical argument for the case. And, and hey, the, what soldier serves at his own, own cost? And, and the Old Testament priesthood and, and the, the, the whole thing about the ox threshing the wheat, all those kinds of things. He's, he's made a biblical argument. And, but he, what he's saying at the end is, whether you pay me or not, it's not going to change the fact that I'm going to do what God called me to do. Why? I am surrendered to the call of God. Pay or no pay, credit or no credit, pat on the back or not, I'm going to do what God's called me to do. And I'll tell you what we need in the church today. We need men and women who are so committed to Jesus Christ that they have surrendered their rights and they're saying, I will go forward with Jesus Christ no matter whether I get paid for it, no matter whether I get noticed for it, no matter where I get the applause of man or not, I have surrendered my rights completely to Jesus Christ. It's all about His will. Surrendering your rights is trusting God. I cannot increase God's sovereignty, but I can trust Him in the moments of my life. I've had lots of people. There's always going to be a reason why you can't do what God's called you to do. There'll be people who tell you, you can't do it, you can't make it. I've had people, people tell me, you're too young, I don't believe it, you're able, and this kind of stuff. And you know what? They're right. I'm not qualified, I'm not old enough, I'm not wise enough, I'm, maybe I'm too old now, I don't know, whatever the case may be, there's all kinds of reasons why I could never accomplish what God wanted me to accomplish. But I do it not in my power, I do it in His. And your calling is not about your power or your ability, but whether you're willing to surrender dyslexia to Christ and say, Father, this won't hinder you from using me for the kingdom. I surrender my rights, I surrender myself, I surrender all. Whatever it takes, whatever it takes, I'm going to honor Jesus Christ. Would you stand with me today?